I begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians across the many lands on which we gathered and pay my respects to Elders past and present and extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Carolyn Evans. I'm the Vice-Chancellor of Griffith University, co-host of this event along with Hotter, home of the arts on the Gold Coast. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to our second event in our Creating a Future for All series of conversations. Our aim is to bring you outstanding thinkers and leaders to provide their insight in complex and thoughtful ways about the future we want to create and perhaps the futures we're in danger of creating in the post-pandemic world. I'm delighted that one of Australia's foremost journalists, commentators and writers, the legendary Kerry O'Brien, the driving force behind this new series, has come back to continue this series of interviews. Kerry will be known to many of you as one of Australia's most distinguished journalists, authors and commentators. He's a master of the long form interview. We're also delighted to have as our second guest, Sally McManus, Secretary of the ACTU, Australian Council of Trade Unions. Sally made history when she became the first female secretary in the 90 year history of the trade union movement's national peak body. She's the daughter of a railway worker and a clerical officer who graduated with honours from Macquarie University. She joined the ACTU's trainee organisers program in 1994 and from there she became an organiser for the Australian Services Union, focusing in on workers in call centres in the IT sector. In 2004, she became branch secretary of the ASU in New South Wales and the ACT, where she oversaw substantial membership growth. In 2015, Sally McManus moved to the ACTU as vice president and campaigns director and was ultimately elected ACTU secretary two years later. Since that time, she's played a prominent national leadership role and has particularly come to the fore as government, industry and the union movement struggle with the implications of COVID-19 for the economy and employment. In her spare time, she's a keen bird watcher, a fan of both virtual games and sports, and has a black belt in Kung Fu and Taekwondo. There are few people better placed to discuss the challenges of the future for workers and for the union movement. We had hoped to be able to bring you the conversation from a live venue, but with both our participants now barred from Queensland, unfortunately, that's not been possible. But I do welcome all of you joining us virtually for what promises to be a fascinating conversation. I'll now hand over proceedings to Kerry O'Brien. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, Sally McManus, thank you very much for joining us. I know uh, these are very tough times, particularly in Melbourne. Yeah, um, it's great to be here. I also want to acknowledge I'm on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And I know that this has been uh, hosted by the university, but also by um, HOTA and MEAA members there have been stood down like so many people in the entertainment um, industry way back since March. So just want to give a shout out to them too. Indeed. So it's now been seven months since Australia recorded its first COVID-19 case. Beyond the unemployment figures that often only tell part of the story anyway, how do you measure, from your perspective, the accumulated impact of the pandemic on the Australian workforce? Oh, well, so many aspects to talk about there. There's the unemployment figures that you talk about, which of course is is um, extreme, probably maybe up to 15%, maybe bigger. But also there's people who are being directly affected by the virus in that there's over a thousand healthcare workers in Melbourne who have contracted it. So their, their health has been at risk. And as we've got community transmissions also, it's been workplaces that have been the, the places where it's spread. So um, everywhere from aged care homes to obviously security guards to, uh, meat works as well. So it's a workplace transmission problem. And we've had every part of the workforce be affected. It's just in different ways. So there's been a huge loss of hours and income as people have been stood down or they've lost hours. Casual workers have lost their jobs entirely, so many of them. And then we've had a situation for uh, at least um, a month in some parts of the country, but uh, in parts of the country it's gone for much longer, where work workers have had to shift um, from working in an office to working at home. So uh, every working person has been affected by this. It's just really a matter of the extent. And of course, you've got your frontline essential workers who, you know, when the pandemic's been at its peak, whether that be now in Melbourne or whether that be back in um, April in other parts of the country, had to go out and keep working um, whilst uh, everyone else was in lockdown. You've talked about the pandemic exposing fault lines uh, in Australian society. How, how graphic is that exposure? 
I think for a long time, people or everyone, even those people in insecure work have become to normalise it, especially uh, younger people who know nothing else other than having casual jobs. They don't know what it's like even to have annual leave, paid annual leave. And it seemed to be in the time where we had economic growth, well, people could cobble together several uh, casual insecure jobs, labour hire jobs to put together a living wage. And no one liked that, but it was possible to do. And in a way it had become normalised. And all of a sudden the pandemic comes along and there's been two brutal realities um, face everyone in insecure work. And the first one was people were let go. They were let go immediately because of course you don't have any job security if you're a, a casual worker. And then secondly, because they don't have the same set of rights as everyone else, like basic rights like sick leave, um, they didn't have sick leave during a pandemic. And so people were going to work sick. So the, there was that other um, you know, fault line in that people are thinking, well, why are people going to work sick? They're spreading the virus. Well, they're going to work sick because they don't have sick leave. So um, those two things, I think together, the mass experience of losing a job overnight, and secondly, um, having to survive in a pandemic with no leave entitlements, I think is exposed not just for those people in insecure work, but for the whole of Australia, just how wrong it is that we've let it get to a situation where one in three workers are in that situation. So are you referring, uh, I mean, when I say only to workers, that's a very big part of the Australian workforce and vulnerable often. But is that is that the extent of what you're referring to as these fault lines? Oh, well, there's obviously all the other um, fault lines too. This one, I think, is the biggest one that's been exposed. The the nature of this uh, insecure uh, workforce that we have developed over a period of 20 years, and it has changed over that period of time, 25 years, very significantly, um, and, and the consequences of that. There's obviously a whole lot of other um, fault lines, and the, those have been you know, there for people to see too. And I know that I am focusing on the workforce, but you can't blame me really. But um, mm. people that are visa workers, so a whole lot of them have been stuck in our country, have needed to stay in our country. They didn't get job seeker or job keeper. And so they've had nothing. And, you know, you look outside now in Melbourne and it's basically the CBD of Melbourne is owned by delivery riders, like riders for Deliveroo or for Uber Eats or for other ones. And I can put a very um, safe bet that the vast, vast majority of those are um, visa workers who have no, nothing, no other income. It's same with uh, labour hire in, in, in Meatworks. Why is it that people keep going to work? A whole lot of them are visa workers too. So prior to the pandemic, we had um, well over a million workers who are on temporary work visas that were highly insecure. And um, now we've got this situation where we've, we've got them here. And it's like, yes, we've got this um, um, group of workers who are second class citizens, casual workers. If you want to talk about visa workers in a way, they're third class citizens. So, you know, those those fault lines are, are there to see too. Can you think of a bigger peacetime challenge uh, that Australia has faced uh, in terms of uh, in terms of the economy since the Great Depression? I, I think that there's just no question whatsoever that this is um, this is that. It's easily that. Uh, you know, we need to remember that. We have lived through a pandemic before, you know, after World War One, but it's almost not in collective memory. But we're having a pandemic, which is a massive public health crisis alongside um, what is a very, very serious global recession slash maybe depression. And that, you know, there's no, um, you know, a group of uh, Australians in living memory who have been through that. I think it's going to be, obviously, you know, wars are totally different um, matter, but in terms of the economic challenges and the pain that um, that we're all going to face, it's going to be an extremely tough time. And yet it's a, it's a kind of strange moment that we're in, in a sense. I mean, apart from those workers who have already copped it in the neck that you've just talked about, but just the, the, the fluidity uh, and the instability of the situation and trying to estimate what is going to happen when we move beyond this period of huge government subsidy uh, propping the economy up, propping people up, and we had another reminder of that uh, today with, um, with Qantas announcing yet another uh, set of redundancies. I assume, I haven't had time to catch up with it, but I assume uh, because of the border closures and the latest uh, pandemic, the, the latest 
uh, virus wave, and uh, uh, which again just underscores that, uh, I mean, 6,000 workers retrenched only weeks ago, uh, and now uh, another 2,000 plus that yeah. wouldn't have been anticipated even a couple of weeks ago. And, and, and we are still being propped up. Do you have any sense? Is there any way to measure what is going to happen when the, when the government support finally falls away? Well, in the trade union movement, obviously we see a whole lot of things that are behind the statistics. So there's a whole lot of companies at the moment that are just hanging on and it's because they're tied to supply lines like or tied to, for example, retail. Um, so you might have um, factories or small businesses that are supplying to retail, like things like um, places that will make boxes for shoes, for example. So you see the immediate effect in 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 those frontline shops, but the knock-on effects uh, over time are, are, are quite huge. But I think the the thing that makes this hard to quantify is the interplay between the 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 outcome with the pandemic, like the public health parts of it, and the economic parts of it. So it's very hard, like even for the treasury and you know the smartest people that our country would have to be able to you know effectively and confidently model um, what what may or may not happen. People didn't predict uh, the extent of the outbreak in Melbourne. You look at, unfortunately, you know the clusters in um, in Brisbane at the moment, and it's it's absolutely good that they're right on top of that, and those numbers are small enough for people to stay on top of. But I just remember how quickly that got out of control in Melbourne, and all of a sudden, um, you know, where you, you everyone was optimistic, thinking things were going to bounce back, and then they're not. And there's that intangible uh, effect of this, and that's um, certainty and confidence. Confidence for people like you and me, consumers, to spend. Um, confidence for businesses to open and to plan for the future. And that is taking a, a severe battering because um, we can't confidently say that there'll be a, a vaccine soon either. So these are all just realities that that we need to face, um, but um, it's actually hard to feel really optimistic in a, in, a, in a circumstance where there's so many unknowns. So if there was one good thing that's come out of it, uh, you would say, I imagine, that it was the, the sense of Australians pulling together initially, the, the, the establishment of the National Cabinet, uh, the sense of unity of planning, uh, the talk about unions and business and government uh, throwing the kind of ideological baggage over the shoulder and uh, and also pulling in concert for Australia. But the national cabinet stuff is fraying around the edges over borders and so on. And, uh, and the Fairfax papers reported this morning that the weeks and weeks of talks that have been going on between business groups and the unions are bogged down over the same old arguments, the same old sticking points. Is that right? Well, you can't read, you can't believe everything you read in the papers, uh, Kerry. Really, you'd be su surprised that that would be true. Um, you know, at the moment, we 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 gave a commitment to those people in the room that we wouldn't um, have the negotiations outside the room. We'd treat it genuinely and in good faith, and to have those discussions there. I'm um, a bit more optimistic than than the papers have reported, but that's all I really want to say about that. I think you do mm. make a very important point about. Um, the ability of um, our country to pull together when we really needed to. And you just look at the absolute disaster that's happening in the United States, and that's on multiple levels. Uh, and I think that there's, you know, there's been a subconscious and a conscious demand from the public to want their leaders to put aside um, partisan issues and to keep them safe and to protect their jobs as much as they can. And I think that by and large, most leaders have stepped up. I think the other thing is, is that, you know, in our country, you know, people might say, okay, there's a trade union movement, like we're an institution. Well, we are, and we're one that can be relied on when there's a crisis to be there and to step up and to be part of, you know, part of our history is when we need to, is to be part of, you know, a national consensus for the greater good. Uh, so, look, I, I understand the constraints on you and, and the commitment not to talk outside the room uh, for the moment at least, but but I wonder if you can give us a sense in general terms uh, of, of whether you're optimistic, whether you feel there is actual progress that can be measured, and I'm not going to ask you what the measure is. Uh, can you give us a sense of the sort of spirit in the room? I mean, do you feel that there is a real 
different spirit in the room than you might normally have expected in talks about uh, about changes in the workplace? Well, employers aren't a monolithic group, so um, there's different employer lobby groups or employer representatives, and they do come with different perspectives. I would say that um, some of those groups absolutely do come to the table with more extreme views, but not views that are unknown, like this country has seen work choices, like we know what that agenda is for some in business, they've just never really let go of it. It's, um, you know, they've already dusted it off under the pillow that they, they go to sleep with every night and that, you know, they've memorised every page. So for sure, some people have approached it that way, but I wouldn't say that that's been a universal um, approach by business representatives. There's been others who have been more constructive the way we've tried to approach it is we've had um, our principles, which is that, you know, we can't have workers um, be worse off. Now, within that and within employers' uh, concerns that they raise, that they believe that the system could be um, simpler and less complex and other issues they raise um, around, uh, for example, the issue of wage theft, you can see that there could be some common ground around um, both making sure workers are protected, but seeing whether or not um, those concerns that employers are raising that would be that would be um, ones that are that are valid could be met and dealt with without compromising um, the rights of workers. And so, that's what we've been concentrating on. It does involve um, needing to think differently and um, sh sure that some people are capable of that and uh, other people um, not so good at it. And, and are you able to bring a united front from the union side? I mean, there's a lot of different unions and uh, and not everybody is on exactly the same page within the union movement and you wouldn't expect that. But, but, but are you able as a union movement to bring a united front to the table in those very, I think there's five different groups of conversations going on. Yeah, there's about 25 union leaders that are involved in this, um, maybe a, a few more actually. So you're right, that's a very um, diverse group of people. So you've got, you know, the leader of the nurses union and you might have the, um, you know, the metal workers union or the AMWU. So, you know, electrical um, union and you, you might have um, the disability workers union. So they're always going to come um, with particular perspectives, but actually, um, the trade union movement in our country is really um, a united group of people uh, who have common values. We've spent a lot of time thinking through what, uh, where do we want to be in the future? Like what's wrong with um, our current set of rights? We know we had so many problems before the pandemic with record low wage growth. You know, the issue we've already spoken about in terms of the level of job insecurity. So we've actually as a group um, thought deeply about these matters. And so, um, our side being um, united is 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 sort of almost, I shouldn't say it goes without saying because it doesn't go without saying, but it just is yes. where we are at this point in history. I still remember some of those labour conferences uh, with a great deal of union input that wasn't always speaking with the one voice. So uh, back in April, Scott Morrison said it was time for everyone to put their weapons down. And I think he included himself in that. No, no more bosses, no more unions. We're all just Australians now, he said. Uh, but you don't seem to have put all your weapons down. Just this week, you've launched an ad campaign which is being described as a shot across the government's bows, just a reminder. Now, how does that sit with no more bosses, no more unions? Oh, uh, look, the, it was a, like a, a nice line that I guess the Prime Minister um, came up with. Uh, any sort of idea that, you know, there's no workers and no bosses, obviously. I mean, he would say, anyone would say that's not correct. And that, No, no unions, you know, not no workers, no unions, no bosses. No workers, no bosses. What I'm saying about that, I guess, is that there's always going to be a different perspective you're going to come from if you're a, a working person as opposed to the employer. It's not to say that you can't um, put those aside when there's a greater challenge. And in effect, that's what we were doing. Um, uh, employers, unions, workers, the government were saying that we're going to put aside um, all other issues and we're going to work together to save lives and save jobs. And so by and large, we've um, continued to focus on that. Having said that, there's clear um, just differences, ideological differences between us and by and by with the government and also with some employers. But just because you've got ideological differences doesn't mean you can't debate those and share those and that, you mm. know, hopefully the other side 
picks up a few things and, you know, it makes their decision making better. But if you, when, when you're in a recession, as we are, facing even possibly a depression, as we are, doesn't the protection of jobs themselves overshadow the protection of all existing wages and conditions? Does it not get to a point where there is a genuine argument for surrendering some conditions, not all, obviously, some conditions that you might have previously considered sacrosanct in order to protect, to, to, to make some of those changes in order to protect and even create more jobs? Well, if you believed in trickle-down economics, you'd absolutely say that's right. So, for example, uh, employers argued several years ago that if we cut penalty rates, it would lead to jobs growth. And we've heard these arguments over and over again. And in fact, in a way, it's been argued about superannuation now. And what happened with penalty rates, you know, was there a big jobs growth when those were cut? No, it didn't create one single job. And so the idea that if you take something off working people that it's going to automatically mean employers are going to employ more. We just don't accept that um, full stop. But there's another aspect to this. In the context of a ser serious economic downturn, which we're seeing, there's only certain, you know, levers that we've got. So, you know, there's the issue of um, investment, um, investment, private investment. Now, as we were talking about before, there's so much uncertainty about that. There's um, exports. We're not going to see a massive change in that. That's not really a lever. There's domestic spending, and that that is going to be so important with our borders closed. So, of course, that's just you and me and everyone else spending in the economy. If you um, cut wages and the take-home pay of workers, effectively you're shrinking domestic spending because. Um, you know that uh, for those workers in particular, the ones that they would want to cut the wages for are low paid workers. And what do they do? They spend all that money in their local community. And so um, we would say it would be uh, the bad thing, not just for those workers or for the next generation, like there's no way we're going to be passing on worse conditions to the next generation, but actually it's bad for the economy as well. It's also why we say that the other lever, the final lever left is government spending, which is about 35% of GDP, and that that's why there needs to be um, the way to create jobs isn't about cutting working workers' wages. It's about having a job creation plan. And the only people who can do that are governments, state and federal. And so for a while we've been saying we need our governments to step up and be the job creators. And that means um, using that lever of um, government spending in order, like we did after World War II, um, to get the economy going again. But presumably you're not saying... And, and we don't know how long it's going to last to dig ourselves out of the hole once the pandemic's gone, and God knows when that is going to be. But, um, but you're not saying, surely, that, uh, that the government, uh, that it is government money, gov government programs that are going to dig us out of the trough. It's got to be a combined effort, surely. And in, in that context, if from your point of view, wages uh, can't be cut and hours and job descriptions can't become... Uh, more flexible, then, then where are the productivity gains going to come from that will be needed also just to protect jobs, let alone create more? Well, um, a few things. Let's start with the issue of um, government spending. So we believe that they um, should spend money that is going to leave a legacy for the next generation and help in the long term in terms of economic growth. So um, your question to do with productivity, for example, investment that could happen into our um, transport system that could happen in terms of supporting also, for example, um, the, the tourism industry that's been smashed um, in order to uh, support the domestic tourism for people to spend their money here. Um, free childcare, for example, we know and it's been modelled that uh, where that happens, not only does that help obviously in terms of job creation in that area, but the productivity gains and the the growth gains out of having um, women's participation in higher in the workforce is is not something that's argued with by with economists. So um, there's all of those aspects to it. Um, I was talking about the issue of workers' rights because when you talk about wage cuts, like if they're permanent wage cuts, like you'd say, okay, we're going to cut what the minimum wage is or what wage rates are, that absolutely would be disastrous. But at the moment, this is happening. Like not, not that, the actual hours that people are working is being cut everywhere. Like the 
income that, that your average worker is now earning compared to um, before the pandemic is less um, because of stand downs, because of the loss of casual jobs, the loss of all these things. So um, quite often the employers argue about flexibility and we need more flexibility. We've got so much flexibility in our labour market, really it's not funny and we're seeing this right now. Um, you know, the amount of you know, income that's been lost at the moment um, because of the, the pandemic is, is enormous. But, uh, but I think you've expressed um, concern, if not opposition, to the idea of, uh, of employers being able to, to change the job descriptions of workers because of the situation we're in. Um, no, that was something that was uh, supported in terms of the JobKeeper uh, legislation. There's limits around that. Um, there's reasonableness tests around that. And it's, you know, obviously, you know, being able to do something that's within your skills. So that's something that we've been flexible about. We've also been mm. flexible about people working from home. I mean, it's been a total necessity, but it's meant that you know, workers have had to make you know some pretty big changes in terms of um, how all of that works. So, um, I think that some some actually, good, some not so good. Yeah, some not so good, especially if you've got kids. It's been really tough. Um, but I think actually the pandemic has shown that our IR system, despite what people say, is flexible. It's fast. The ability for us to make changes quickly and then for it to apply in a uniform, simple way across the economy in an emergency, we did it. Like we did it as a country, we did it because of the system we've got. Unlike the US where they don't have any of those basic prote protections or the type of you know um, system that we've got, it's an absolute total mess. There's no protections for workers. So I'd say, you know, there's a balance between ensuring that things can change when, they're, when they need to. And I think it's already been demonstrated that certainly our system has, and it does so very efficiently and, and uniformly, and also protecting workers at the same time. Um, there's a balance to be struck there. And I think actually it's been struck fairly well. So there's been a lot of talk about how things are going to change uh, and will never be the same after the pandemic uh, has ended. What are the big permanent changes that you might identify now? Uh, that will be with us into the indefinite future as a result of this whole experience? Well, put aside the fact that I think people will have um, better hygiene around <laughs> washing their hands forever. Um, I think in the workforce... I'm not sure how long um, that'll last, but one can hope. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, our nurses' union talks about it. They, um, they, they, they obviously, the, the rates of um, flu uh, infections this year are right down and, you know, they're very happy that, that, that there might be a change in mindset with people. But anyway, I think um, some of the bigger changes in terms of the workforce uh, are more of a um, push by employers and probably also from employees to want more flexibilities about around working from home. As you said, some people have... Um, have found that a struggle for a whole lot of reasons and other people have um, have thought that it's better in terms of being able to save, you know, time in, in, in travel and to be able to, you know, manage um, caring responsibilities. That throws up a lot of big questions, a lot of questions in terms of um, who's responsible for, um, you know, the costs of that. How do you ensure that uh, there's fair working hours and there's not, this doesn't lead to, um, work intensification and unfair work intensification and effectively pay cuts by just telling people, expecting people to be able to work all hours and any hours. But then again, workers might want flexibility too. So I think that there's likely to be some big changes around that. I think that also in terms of technology, very rapidly, so many companies have had to change what they do and how they do it. Um, I think that that's likely to continue. And I think the way that a whole lot of businesses and, and workplaces will work will be um, more remote working in terms of even meetings. Like, um, uh, the, I, I don't want to get back on the same amount of planes I've been on before after all of this. I'm quite, I'm usually on planes all the time. And I know that many other people think, well, hang on a minute, it's, it's more it's it's more efficient to do it a, a different way. Um, you know, there's some of some of, of those uh, types of changes. I think that it's quite obvious. Like I, I, I mentioned the issue of insecure work. I think that this has been brought to the fore. I think that there, there needs to be changes there. I don't think there'll be the same acceptance of um, the levels that we've had and the unfairness of it. I think that the area of aged care is um, also 
in the spotlight in terms of, you know, is this really what we want for our elders and what changes need to happen? For a long time, the healthcare unions have been talking about stuff, ratios, but now we just see horribly, um, you know, consequences of not having those safeguards. I think the issue of um, local manufacturing and the fact that we let our whole not our whole, but a lot of our manufacturing industry go and go offshore. I think there's real questioning about that and about um, the need for us to be um, self self sufficient and the the value in having those um, those industries here in Australia. Well, let's just for the sake of this uh, exercise um, assume that you're right about the fault lines that you've identified, and you would say that uh, that casualisation, significant casualisation of the workforce, that the the practices of labour hire companies have been a significant contributing factor to that. Now, th just as two uh, significant elements in the modern Australian uh, industrial relations system, uh, hasn't the horse bolted? I mean, are you saying that you would want to turn those things around? You would want a, 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 um, a considered drive to actually reduce casualisation, to somehow uh, reduce the the activities of the labour hire companies? It's absolutely what I'm saying, absolutely. I think that um, the problem we have is that some employers will not even admit that it's an issue. And actually some in the commentariat um, and some politicians say the same too. They just say it's not an issue. And sometimes I think I'm living in another world to them, the fact that they don't realise that this is a huge, um, you know, quality of life, um, quality of, of community issue um, for working people. That was prior to the pandemic. Now they can hopefully see that uh, more up close. I mean, labour hire is is like the worst form of insecure work. You don't even have the same connection to the workplace that 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 permanent casual or direct casual workers have. And turning down a shift may mean that you just go down to the bottom of the list and you don't come back for a long time. So um, getting rid of the extent of that, I think needs to be a national ambition. We should have a conversation as a nation. Do we think it's okay that we've got to the point where we've got third highest level of insecure work in the OECD, third highest. Now there's plenty of other very successful economies that um, have, uh, let's say ours is around 35% or say 33% that have around 25%. Well, is should that be our ambition? Should we be in the middle of the pack in terms of the OECD? I don't think it's got anything to do with the success of a country, the amount of um, the, the just taking rights off, off a whole lot of people, which effectively we've been doing. Um, and I think that having an ambition and one that's shared nationally for us to say it's just gone too far um, and that there's a place for uh, casual work, there's a place for labour hire, but it is about short term work. It is about when it's um, unpredictable. It's not a permanent job that it goes on and on and on for years and years and years. It's just, I think, wrong. We've led, led ourselves into that situation and we shouldn't have two classes of workers with two sets of rights. But uh, you'd have to acknowledge that a significant number of those casual workers are by choice, that, uh, that there are those who do want flexibility in their lives. And secondly, correct me if I'm wrong, but, uh, but my read of the Bureau of Stats figures on the casualised workforce is that it's been relatively stable around 25% over some years. Over about um, 24 years, it's been relatively stable. This is casual work, which is one form of yes. insecure work. And we did let yeah. that um, get, it shouldn't be at it where it is as far as um, we are concerned. On top of that, what we've seen happen is the growth of the gig economy. So this is another form of insecure work. I know sometimes I use the term casual because it's hard to like list all the different forms. So in that you've got all these gig economy workers, which we were talking about before, who aren't even considered as employees. And so they don't even get any of the basic rights. They've got less rights than workers did 100 years ago. And this is a something that's been grappled with around the world. How do we do this? How do we regulate it? How do we make sure that those workers get rights? We've got to deal with that here too. Labor hire is another form of insecure work I've talked about. Another form of insecure work is rolling ongoing fixed term contracts. You see so much of this in the university sector, you see it in health, you see it in uh, elsewhere, where you never ever get permanency. Now, in the rest of the OECD, there's limits on rolling fixed term contracts. So um, 
whilst you say, okay, some people want to be uh, in casual work, sure, they do. We're not saying get rid of casual work. We're just saying that it's gone too far and a whole lot of jobs that are actually permanent jobs have just been converted into so-called casual jobs. Uh, I don't think it's going far to say that you declared war on neoliberalism when you became the ACTU uh, secretary, but the glory years of Labor under Hawke and Keating in the 80s and 90s were built on a Labor version of the neoliberal model, were they not? Lower taxes, including company tax, spending cuts, surpluses, privatisation, deregulation of financial markets, big tariff cuts that saw a lot of factories and jobs disappear, less centralised, less regulated labour market. Now, unions had a huge uh, say in those decisions. They had never and have never since had the same um, uh, influence over government policy as they did in those years. But looking back, weren't unions shooting themselves in the foot, if not more seriously than the foot? They're much more than a flesh wound, I would have thought. Yeah, well, I suppose the statistics unfortunately speak for themselves at the time you were talking about um, when these ideas first came about in terms of neoliberalism, our um, union density was higher than 50% and now it's around 15%. So um, a lot of what uh, was started um, by the Keating government, um, not entirely um, led to it, it didn't. It was more John Howard when he came in who applied, you know, the ideas of neoliberalism, you know, much more rigor rigor rigorously. So Labor on one hand, you know, back then did um, start some of those changes, but they also did things that are exactly the opposite, like built Medicare, built the universal superannuation system, um, those things as well. So um, I think that we just have to deal with things as they are today. And I think that the extent of privatisation that we've seen in this country and the fact that um, it's still pursued by you know some governments is shown itself, I think, to have promised a lot. Uh, it's promised that there's going to be cheaper prices, better service and all of that. And I think after... 20 years of experimenting with that, that um, clearly that's not the case in in all, if not uh, in most of the circumstances. What companies do, like we see in private aged care, is you privatise it and they've got to find ways to to make money. And that's their, their job. They're a private company. And so but, they cut corners, whether that be but, meals or whether that be staffing and in order to, to, you know, for the profit drive. And I just think that there's a lot to learn ab about that. And um, I think that certainly in the areas of all essential services, um, you know, including places like aged care, that they shouldn't be in private hands. Well, in national terms, it was Labor again. It was Hawke and Keating, particularly Paul Keating, who started that big privatisation drive. Are you really saying that you can actually, you could pull off, a, we collectively as a nation could pull off a U-turn on that? We could, we could actually reverse the privatisation process? Or maybe, again, it should be a, a goal. It should be uh, something that we consider in terms of where do we want to be as a country. Um, a lot of that privatisations happen at a state level. Obviously, state governments are the ones that uh, have, you know, utilities, water and, and uh, electricity that at various times have been privatised. And I don't think that the experiment, especially in terms of things like you know, natural monopolies uh, has led to um, this, this you know, great future that was promised at the time. It hasn't. It's money that's also been lost to the taxpayer. And really, that's you and me paying for schools and hospitals. So I, I, I do think that um, as a country, we went too far in terms of, you know, down the road of neoliberalism. Uh, I did have a, a chat to, to Paul Keating after I was elected because, you know, there was a lot of discussion around this particular issue. And you know, he said to me that, um, you know, the decisions he made was based on the Australia as it was then and the economic times that it was then. And that if he were the treasurer today, he'd be making different decisions. Um, so, you know. He didn't say what he, they were, did he? What's that? I don't know if he, he didn't was say what they he were, was going to nationalise Qantas, but, um, <laughs> you know, in terms well, of... It, it, was, his, the it public was his sector, decision to sell it off. Yeah. The importance of the public sector um, uh, more so in terms of, you know, what was important with the changing um, demographics in, in particular uh, was, was, was something that he mentioned. Mm. So, so you've acknowledged that uh, 
that uh, the Keating agenda of uh, beginning the process of deregulation of the labour markets was, in a way, the start of the slippery slope uh, for the union movement in terms of the decline in its membership, the really dramatic decline in its membership. But, but and, and pre-virus, uh, Australia was already starting to see stagnating wages, as you uh, identified earlier, across Australia for several years at least, to the point where the Reserve Bank governor was uh, was urging employers to, and ur essentially urging unions to go harder on wage rises. He was saying we needed a boost in incomes. It's, uh, Reserve Bank is hardly a, a radical institution, but how does that reflect on the strength and capacity of the trade union movement that you basically need the Reserve Bank governor giving you a push uh, to try and get better outcomes on wages? I'll just go back um, a little bit in terms of the reasons for union growth, um, the issues of uh, major structural change, changes in the economy, us moving more to a service-based economy, you know, was a much bigger factor. Also, John Howard was another big factor too. He changed uh, workplace laws where uh, removed the ability for um, the encouragement of, of union membership. So, so that's a big thing. Getting back to what you're saying about the Reserve Bank Governor, well, this is an issue of bargaining power. The reason why we have record low wage growth is connected to the levels of unionisation. It is uh, because how do wages go up? You know, unions make wages go up. Either that or it's an issue of supply and demand for those workers who are in a particular position where they've got skills that are that are really sought after. It's not that um, employers are just turning around and saying, here, here's a pay rise. Like if 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 that were the answer, we'd be seeing you know wage growth all the time. But the connection between harsher workplace laws, which has basically constrained unions over a period of time, and we've got extremely harsh labour laws in our country in terms of um, constraining the rights of workers to exercise bargaining power, um, is I think the main reason why we've got record low wage growth. Well, we to, did have, what, what, we still what, do. But, yeah. But what do you identify from the union side? And you have to be honest with yourselves on this if you're going to kind of improve the situation from your side, I would imagine. And you strike me as a fairly straight shooter. So what what do you identify from the union side as, as the failures to see what was coming and adapt and somehow work out ways to stay relevant and attractive uh, for for trade union membership, particularly with younger generations coming on? Yeah, firstly, I'd say this is that every other developed country recognises that unions are a public good. So they have policies, and they differ a bit depending on the part of the world you're in, that support union membership because they know that if you don't support unions in what they do and give them ways of um, of making sure that, that there's uh, support for union membership, that essentially you'll have what you've got in Australia. We've got all of that. We've got just as bad as in the south of the US. Um, other than that, you struggle very hard to find uh, a, a, an equivalent country that's anywhere near um, what we are. So first of all, I would say that you need um, governments that are actually going to support um, our union membership. The other thing I'd say is that sometimes we didn't take opportunities um, when they were there. And so if you go to the issue of insecure work, I think we um, could have um, foreseen more that this is where it was going to go. And at various times we might have had opportunities to uh, push this harder. Um, we didn't take them um, when they were there. So that's, a, um, I think, a fair reflection on, 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 on that, especially when you look at um, where we are now. And the other thing is, is that there's also been very significant technological change. So. Um, you know, people these days, in order to sometimes find out, you know, what they're meant to be paid, it's Google that they'll go to um, to work that out. So um, unions ourselves haven't changed enough in terms of how accessible we are to people. And by accessible, I mean, you've got a whole generation of people who expect to be able to inter inter interact and to be able to um, uh, participate in uh, their uh, things that they're a member of or part of um, online quickly and easily. You can't do that um, w with most unions. It's too hard to find out sometimes what a union to even join. Now, um, those are things that are all within our control. And so uh, I think that basically the, the, 
that technological disruption has happened around us and we haven't um, been quick enough to respond. Mind you, we're um, prioritising this as a, as a major thing that we do need to do because um, we recognise that, uh, that if we don't, we're going to be completely left behind. So uh, isn't it true that, uh, that one significant factor has been that where you once had a plethora of big, big companies, big enterprise, big workforces, yep. You've now got a lot of much smaller workforces, much smaller businesses that are virtually ununionized. And yeah. is that not something that you should have seen coming? Uh, yes, uh, we probably should have. I mean, we could beat ourselves up all day thinking about, or oh, you know, what we should have seen in our crystal ball and and how we could have prepared for it. But that is absolutely part of uh, the story of union membership decline, absolutely. And it's part of moving to more of a service-based economy um, and the consequences of that. And the the system of um, bargaining that, that we that we had back when enterprise bargaining first came in, we had a different economy. It was, as you were talking about, big factories, we had a manufacturing industry. And so you could um, pursue enterprise bargaining with the type of bargaining power that you would need in those large uh, workplaces to get um, fair outcomes. Now, of course, what happens when you um, dilute that down to much smaller organisations, that's much, much harder. And it's also not a efficient. It's not, um, you know, it doesn't make sense if you're in a small workplace to be, you know, negotiating, spending, you know, months negotiating with your employer over an enterprise agreement. It just makes sense that if you're in a childcare centre, for example, a not-for-profit childcare centre, that um, you should be able to bargain across your whole sector rather than each childcare centre after each childcare centre. And that's why we've been arguing that our bargaining um, rules need to change so that every worker has access to collective bargaining. At the moment, effectively, they don't because of those issues you raise. So when we saw those figures from the Productivity Commission uh, just in the last few weeks uh, showing a, a quite significant decline uh, in wage growth of young Australian workers, mm -hmm. uh, um, and I think in the under 25s, it's, it, it's been a it, it's been a consistent uh, cut series of cuts, as I understand it, going all the way back to about 2001, and for over 35s, under 35s, it was uh, back to for at least the last 10 years. Now, what do you what do you finger? Right, what is at the heart of that long term decline in young people's wages? Union membership, like the fact that um, the, the whole bigger macro picture of workers not having this, the enough bargaining power to be able to balance things out is part of what's happening. And when you look at the rates of insecure work casualisation amongst that same cohort of people, it's extremely high. You have now a whole generation that, that doesn't know what a sick day is, a paid sick day, paid, paid annual leave. And so when you're in that situation, inevitably you have less bargaining power because if the employer the next day can just say goodbye, you know, it makes it much harder to uh, be, you know, saying, please give me a pay rise. So uh, those, those issues interact, absolutely they do. And both of them need to be addressed if, we, if we're going to deal with this intergenerational, you know, problem we've got. I don't, don't want to spend too much time offering, uh, you know, inviting you to lash yourself, but uh, <laughs> but it does strike me significantly that that when when you're talking about the casualised, low-paid workforce, particularly young people in the service sector, and particularly women, young and older, uh, I mean, it just seems that that the unions have to take a significant part of the responsibility for that. For the, that, there is a a clear union failure there somewhere why? as a part of why it. Do I mean, we metal workers. Why do metal, we have to? Well, because because otherwise your your relevance presumably just keeps shrinking. I mean, as if you take Amazon Amazon workers employees or say JB Hi-Fi or Domino's Pizza uh, as against the kinds of uh, union protection and the strength of unions like the metal workers um, in the past. I mean, there is a there is a serious disconnect between those two, isn't there? <laughs> but you can't compare apples with apples. Like you're talking about, it's almost like saying to um, this generation of unionists or the one just before me that, that you know, you should be doing the same thing as the generation did like Bill Kelty. You can see over this side, um, it was a different world. It was a different world that they were operating with where 
in terms of what their rights were to take even basic things like industrial action, there wasn't massive fines um, for individuals and for unions. It wasn't, um, you know, at, at the moment, it's almost criminalised in some parts of our country or the governments keep trying to do so. It didn't have that situation. You had a centralised wage fixing system where the institutions and in law encouraged union membership. Now, all of that's been stripped away and you've got, you know, this generation of workers are dealing with that. So, yes, you're right in saying that, um, you know, identifying what the problems are and what we're going to do about it. But those problems aren't small problems and they aren't problems that we've necessarily brought on ourselves. There has been a deliberate strategy over a period now of many decades, um, starting with John Howard, starting with Margaret Thatcher, starting with Ronald Reagan, to try and reduce the um, influence of workers' power, which is unions. And they've done that explicitly over that period of time. Um, that's what we're up against. And so I find it like hard to accept that working people should be blamed for their entirely for their situation. Like this is also no, I'm not something working that's... working people, we're talking about the union movement, as, in, as in those who are driving the unions. Yeah, but it's almost like we've got all these levers that we we can just pull uh, to to fix things, and we 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 don't like this. Now needs serious surgery if you're going to um, fix um, some of these big problems. And really, what I'm saying is that it's got to start with uh, as a country saying, well, is this what we want? And the consequence of not supporting the union movement means that we now have record low wage growth. It means that we have um, so much insecure work. It means that, you know, we've got, um, you know, the gig economy, which is unregulated entirely. Uh, is this the type of country we want? Is this is this what we want? Or do we think it was actually probably um, better when workers had a bit more bargaining power and a bit more say? Yeah, so... And I'm thinking as you're saying this, that, it, that if it is all but impossible to stage a strike today, isn't the battle already lost? And I'm saying this in the context of, I read the story of, of your first march in support of a strike was when you were still a school student. What was that about? And, and, and what is the likelihood of, of an, an equivalent person to you, student today to you, and the others involved in that strike being able to have that strike? Well, it was about um, neoliberalism. It was about the Griner government. It was, was a new Liberal government that got elected in New South Wales and they went about um, attacking the public sector. And part of that was obviously um, schools and teachers. And I was at a public school and they started sacking our teachers. And I was in year 11 and all of a sudden history teacher was gone. Um, and, you know, we felt this directly. The teachers organised and they had strike action. Now, the consequences for that union, the Teachers Federation back then, of taking that strike action, like, no one was going to... Um, they, they weren't fined. The 50,000 people that were there, that didn't happen to them either. The law's now in New South Wales by the government um, because it's a state law, but it's not really that much different have changed so that's exactly what would happen now individuals would be fined and so would um and so would the union and so i guess what your point about this needing to change uh i agree with how to get there is another matter um, i guess the first thing as i've been trying to say is we've got to talk about it we've got to say well you know is this the type of country we want is it important that workers can um, band together in their unions and is this an important part of a healthy democracy to balance out the power of um, those that have power. And of course, the other thing we've seen and around the world too with the decline in union membership is a growth in inequality. And we're now in a situation where, you know, we've got you know, record inequality in Australia and that's also part of that. So I don't think that this can, is a simple problem. I think it's one that we have to talk about directly and that, you know, in terms of what the union movement does about it. There's many options open to us, but uh, at the moment, what we're saying is that we've got to put on the table what the problems are. So when you say, as you did, uh, that uh, that that some uh, unlawful action is justified if you're if you're striking against unjust laws, um, what you're also saying is that if you did try to uh, break the law in that way, that you would be fined out of existence. Yeah, what I was saying is that industrial action in our country is is effectively you know criminalized you get fined for it you have 
all of this happen to you. There's only a certain like tiny window where you're allowed to take so-called legal industrial action. And, you know, it's a, an ILO convention, an international um, legal convention that um, people uh, around the world workers should have the right to take um, industrial action. So I was to defending the, pe the right of people to do that, the right of workers to withdraw their labour if they feel as though they have to. And I believe that, like it's it's right. It, it's if workers have um, no other option, and the only option you've got is to withdraw your labour. That's something that we should be supporting as a democracy. It's a big it's a big uh, debate to to have a big discussion to have, and and I know it would become very heated very quickly given all the sides that would be involved in it. But we're we're getting close to time, and I want to spend the rest of the time talking about the future workforce, the changing nature of work. Uh, and uh, and and the kind of the kind of workforce requirements that we should be fashioning should be thinking about now. Uh, I mean, um, when you when you look at at the impact of the digital age already, and we know that the change that we've experienced so far, as fast as it has been, is not likely to be anywhere near as fast as the changes we might be copying in the next five years, 10 years, 15 or 20, which makes it very difficult to plan. So how are the unions planning under your leadership to meet the challenges of a digital workforce, say 10 years from now, 20 years from now? Should we be thinking of how we as a society are going to maintain some kind of, of equity or fairness in the sharing of available jobs? We know a lot of traditional jobs, white as well as blue collar have already disappeared and more are going to. We don't know how many jobs are going to replace them, whether it will be the same number or more or less. There are many people with a, whose views are differing right across the landscape. So, so how do you plan for that? Well, um, first of all, we look at the evidence and we listen to the experts. So it's a very contested area, this area about are the robots taking all the jobs and does that mean that jobs or work is going to disappear? Um, there's plenty of people out that spruiking that idea and that if that were the facts and true, well, there, there's a whole lot of consequences that flow from it. But actually workforce participation, so the amount of people actually working prior to the pandemic was at record highs. And what we've seen happen is it's more about some jobs changing and new jobs being created. That's more of the challenge rather than sometimes I feel as though it's a bit of scaremongering about saying that jobs are going to disappear because they're not. If they were, it would be a different matter. Um, so I think that this does um, mean that in terms of the skills of the future, they will be different ones. I think in terms of how people relate to each other and organise um, um, from the perspective of workers will be different. Um, I've seen uh, a massive um, uh, experience of this during the coronavirus where all of a sudden that sort of sense of being together in a workplace disappeared for so many workers and it was replicated by uh, technology. And so on one hand, lots of people um, find that alienating and, uh, you know, absolutely after a whole day full of Zoom, you know, you really don't want to um, ever look at a screen again. However, um, on the other hand, I've seen you know, meetings of workers all around the world, and many unions have seen this all around the world, that have been larger and bigger, more inclusive, um, more participatory um, than ever. And I think that the more you um, uh, isolate people in their personal lives and you mix that with work, there's going to be a need, a human need for collective connection um, to be able to interact with your workmates and with, with other like-minded people is going to be more of a need than less of a need because if there's less of that at work, there'll be a need for that elsewhere. So I think that um, the changes at work will have a huge, um, more likely to have a quite a large psychological impact um, that is often not talked about. I don't mean in terms of mental health issues. I mean in terms of the way we see being at work and what that means to work with colleagues, how we work in teams, how we how we interact. Given that, I think that um, technology is more likely to change that. There's a lot of talk about the need for different skills, soft skills, um, you know, people skills, empathy skills, problem solving skills, critical thinking skills, which is also pretty, pretty ironic given the government's wanting to cut back on art, on, the, on money to support um, people doing arts degrees. 
And I think that that's true. We know that, um, you know, with the type of technological changes we're seeing in workplaces, you're not going to be doing the job in the same way. Um, when you start your work, if you stay there for any longer than five years, that's going to change. Yeah, but um, I mean, you, you, are, you are looking at a situation now where we've got significant skill shortages in this country and, and a very significant part of the reason we've got those skill shortages is because we are bad. We are just not very yeah. good at anticipating the skills that, that are, that, that say, three, four, five years ago, identifying the skills we were going to need now. There is, there is this process in the pipeline uh, where that's taking up to five years in the TAFE, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the tertiary trade sector, where education sector, where it can take five years for the various state bodies to agree on the training required for a particular skill. And by the time that training has been determined to reshape a course, it's already become obsolete. So how on earth are we going to be going as this process gets quicker and quicker? How on earth are we going to keep up with it? I think it's a slightly different issue. It's not that um, we've chosen we've we've chosen not to um, decide that we want to have a plan for where we want our skills. We've actually governments have actually consciously decided no, we're just going to leave that to the free market. We're not going to have a forward planning um, way of doing things. We are not going to, as a country, say, okay, we think we are going to be good at X. Like, let's just say it's, I don't know, um, medical technologies. Um, we've got a competitive advantage here. We are going to make sure we build um, the skills around that. We've decided part, partly because of neoliberal thinking not to do that. Alongside that, we've gutted the TAFE system. Like, that's what we've done. And you can't say on one hand, oh, it takes a long time to do things. On the other hand, you you, you pull out um, so much funding and support for that particular area. So I agree with you in that this is a big problem. And a lot of um, uh, it's been filled in so many ways by a different type of immigration, by temporary skilled um, labour, as opposed to permanent migration. And that's changed the makeup of the workforce. Also, the, the type of um, of, of our migration program that we've got in our country too. And that's all been because in the end, we've decided let's just leave it to the free market. In the end, it'll all work itself out. Well, it hasn't worked itself out. It's much better well, if we do um, forward plan, like you say, and that we um, work out what we need to do as a country. And then we build um, the skills and the opportunities for young people around that. So when you talked about, uh, about, um, about building for the future, uh, the Business Council of Australia has uh, challenged uh, the Prime Minister to, as they've put it, get off the fence and, uh, and pick some winners in industry to actually identify up to 10 uh, industries that, that, uh, that, uh, at which Australia could do extremely well that would and could underpin our economy going into the future and our, our safeguard our prosperity. Uh, do you support that? And do you actually Absolutely. believe... And do you actually believe that that we can ever rebuild our manufacturing base the way it once was as a part I of that? Do, I do support um, what you just described that the Business Council has put forward. Um, the deliberate policy of governments not to pick winners uh, clearly has not served our country well. Uh, we should be having industry plans um, like we used to have in order to plan for the future and put ourselves in the in the best position that we can. I forgot the second part of your question. Well, that uh, that basically it was it was really one question, which is which is uh, whether you support the identification of of those those industries with the with yeah. the potential, but also can we can we rebuild uh, a, a healthy, productive, and bigger manufacturing base than we have? actually surrendered? Well, um, seeing all of this up close in during the coronavirus um, period that's still continuing, but especially uh, four months ago, was um, an eye-opener for me. Essentially what happened is that, you know, I was in the middle of seeing um, from the workers' perspective in the healthcare area, as well as, you know, being involved in discussions with the government, the fact that we had a serious um, shortage of um, PPE 
in our country and we couldn't, uh, we didn't have the facilities to be able to produce it. And a whole lot of other medical supplies we couldn't either. And what happened is that basically a whole lot of um, companies um, stepped up with often the support of, of, of the unions in those areas to refashion what they were doing to be able to um, basically create a local manufacturing industry for those, what we needed really quickly. So the idea of can we do it? Of course we can do it. Of course we can do it. It's a matter of us saying that we want to do it and also saying that we're going to back in um, those industries as well. It doesn't always mean just because it's cheaper, it's better. And we've seen what happened in the coronavirus. You can't always rely on international um, supply chains either. Hmm. Last question, Sally. You... Um and it's an obvious question in a way, uh, your average CEO these days doesn't seem to last in any job for more than four or five years. It used to be a lot longer. Um, your, uh, your job carries a lot, of, uh, a lot of pressure with it, none more so than right now and into the certainly the next 12 months at least and, and for however long it takes us collectively to find our way out of this. I wonder uh, how long you give yourself as a, as a kind of broad brush thing uh, before you feel it's time for somebody fresh to step in? And do you have any pretension to follow in the footsteps of a, a Bob Hawke, a Simon Crean, a Jenny George, a Greg Combay, a Jed Carney into Parliament? Yeah, it's funny. I've got um, behind me, there's the pictures of all the previous leaders of the ACTU going right back um, 95 years. And one guy was there for 20 years. And I just think, well, how did you do that? Like, how could you possibly... They're a very different world. <laughs> yeah, it must have been. Um, I don't think that you can last in in the type of type of role I'm doing for for that long. So it just says that things changed a lot. You certainly, obviously, didn't have email or, or mobile phones, and people thinking they can get you 24 um, seven. I always, for for me, sort of set set myself at the beginning of this. I I, I want to go um, really hard and and put everything I've got into it for a period of time. And that put, period of time is probably not longer than um, eight years. Now we've had the um, pandemic. I don't know if that sort of compresses things because you are right in saying that that is a um, a, a, a big experience. But you know, like like anyone, you know, you build in all the things you've got to build in to make sure that um, that that you're there for the long term because you know workers need you. On your second part of um, the question, do I have aspirations to go into parliament? The answer is no. Simple as that. Simple as that. So I think I'm, um, I think my 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 talents, if I've got any, uh, are, are suited to movement building. Um, and if uh, people could find a role for me after <laughs> after I do this beyond bird watching, I'd you know like to to play a role in you know movement building. Yeah, well, there are some who would say that Parliament House needs a bit of movement building in itself. <laughs> what <clears throat> what practical legacy do you want to be remembered for? Mm, I would like to turn around union density. Good luck with that. It's a big Selling one to say because the figures come out. You can't sort of, you know, you can't, you know, can't inflate things, can you? Uh, Sally McManus, thank you very much thank uh, you. for being part of this conversation. Thank you. It falls to me to thank both Sally and Kerry for this amazing conversation tonight. I know Carolyn opened by saying we wished that people could have been here at Hotter with us, um, but it just wasn't possible because of the border closures and the ongoing issue with COVID-19. I have no doubt that this evening's conversation was extraordinary. You know, we live in times where thinking about the most vulnerable of our workforce and about female leadership is incredibly important. Uh, so I thank both Sally and Kerry for their insights tonight. And also to Carolyn and the team at Griffith, Hot is delighted to be able to do this conversation series. I keep saying there's nothing more important than us having these discussions at this time. And we look forward to hopefully welcoming you to the next discussion here in the Lakeside Terrace soon.